Thank you for coming to this Lake and Wildlife meeting. Out of the fog and the rain and the wind, uh, we're very happy to have you here today. Um, to start the meeting, we always want to put up our mission, which is living in Bentry is a privilege, which includes the responsibility to care for natural world around us. Therefore, our Lake and Wildlife works to preserve the natural beauty and wildlife of Bentry by encouraging Bentry CI and all residents to be good stewards of our natural resources. And we do that by monitoring, educating, and volunteering. And I put that up for those of us that have been here and the new people so you can see where we're headed, what we do, and, and, and keep that in mind every time we make a decision here and on the executive team. So moving along, we always keep that in mind as we go. To begin with, Harold, come on up and let us know what the board's up to. Um, this information cannot, first of all, if you don't get the Friday news, you need to find out why, because all, all this information basically is in there, or you can watch the board meetings uh, either live on the third, fourth, fourth Tuesday of every month, or you can watch the recordings of that. So I, I, I would encourage you all to do that. Um, I'm just going to be give you this, uh, kind of a synopsis of what the board did this past month. Uh, the first thing we did is we appointed uh, Margie Robinson and Sandra Stewart as the election supervisors, which is an important job here in Benton Terrain. We appreciate their volunteering to do that. The stables committee uh, is committed to reducing the subsidy for the stables by at least $10,000 for the next budget year. So they're working diligently to do that. A committee of residents is looking at options. The Bent Tree owns 28 acres down on Cove Road. They're going to look at everything and anything and all things. And they, there's no plan at this point. But if you have any ideas or suggestions, you can contact Brian Feehan or Laird Carmichael. They're going to consider everything for those 28 acres. Um, a contract has been signed to have Rhino Builders repair the bridge over the spillway, which I'm sure a lot of you who walk are anxious about that. Um, Thanks to Peter Kilpo and a group of Bent Tree residents, they got the cost down to $47,000, which sounds like a lot, but the first estimates we got were in the $200,000 range. And uh, it's it seemed like a simple project, but it's turned out to be not so simple. They're gonna have the steel beam should be in place maybe by now or in the next few days. And then the by the end of March, the bridge should be completed, which will be a welcome thing. That's weather permitting, of course. Um, I think uh, some people here are involved with learning tree classes. The, they're going to have be every Wednesday night in May, and uh, we encourage you. They're going to fill up fast, so you need to sign up for those. And they're going to have a um, food service package available for the people who take that class. Um, there's new stairs at the head of the trail on uh, Tamarack Drive. And there's some new stairs going from the pavilion area at the beach down. The Bent Tree Building and Grounds crew got those done. If you haven't seen those, you should go take a look. And they also built some railings around the um, sand area at the pavilion to keep the sand in. Um, there's been some renovations on the interior at the tavern. They're now completing, including some of the necessary things for fireproofing. And some shelving has been added, so that's helpful. And right in the middle of that construction, the county in in health inspector came, and they passed with an A-plus, even despite having all that construction going on. Uh, if you haven't noticed, these lights are building these are all LED lights. Everything in here is LED now, which is going to make better lighting and um, also is going to save us a lot of money on electricity. And so we appreciate building and grounds for doing that as well. Uh, the water department completed 4,200 feet of six inch water lines on Tamarack Drive. And uh, if, um, if you go out the back gate a lot, I'm sure you're glad that that's finished, but that's a lot of, they had a lot of rock. Um, the board recently granted contractors the ability to purchase transponders so they can get in and out of the gate without having to go through security. And they have to meet certain criteria and certain requirements to be able to purchase those. And mostly uh, companies who have uh, who are in and out of here every day, like uh, heating and air and gas companies and people like that do that. But that uh, saves our Mint Tree public safety people a lot of time. And the contractors a lot of times also generated $7,000 in revenue for Mint Tree. Uh, the fireworks are going to be on July the 5th, not the 4th. <laughs> so just telling you. So, uh, 
The Firewise grant program is waiting for final approval, and it's coming from the federal government. Once that gets started, the first thing they're going to do with, in conjunction with public safety is they're going to work on the uh, undergrowth under the power lines because that's where the most fires start or happen, and so they're going to be doing that, and hopefully that will get started pretty soon. Um, public safety is going to be coordinating a fall prevention, not fall as in autumn but like people falling because the most of the um, and they, they've got a program they're going to have to have show you how not to fall I guess <laughs> <laughs> anyway it's going to be open to, it's going to be open to the public it'll be limited <laughs> I, I, anyway they explained it better than I did so anyway but if you're interested in that please do that <laughs> The work to make the tavern and the golf shop ADA compliant is mostly completed. They've had some contractor issues there, but uh, they've got most of that work done, and so we appreciate that. The board of directors approved a revision to the employment policies to remove cannabis from bent trees, pre-employment drug screening, and random testing. This was done after much evaluation, researching other business models, reviewing potential consequences and potential outcomes. <laughs> um, the board is also working on what we're calling a private pass program to get outsiders to be able to come in here and use our facilities like golf, tennis, beach, and that sort of thing. And uh, the costs are going to start at $5,000. And this year, it's because it's a pilot program, they're only going to sell 10 of these outside private pass uh, programs. If it works, then they'll, we'll expand the program. Um, just to see if it works both financially and to not in harm anybody in Bent Tree or inconvenience anybody in Bent Tree. Um, in future, and this came from Lake and Wildlife um, as a request, in future publications of the Echo, there's going to be a monthly calendar of all activities and a list of house sales, closings, and listings, which was that suggestion was made to me to take to the board, which um, from Lake and Wildlife Executive Committee. Uh, there were a few other board actions that mostly involved clarifications of wordings and policies to make them more consistent, concise, and clear. And again, that information is available in the um, Friday news, and I would encourage you to do take a look at that or watch the recording of the board meetings or actually attend the board meetings. They're so exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Appreciate it. Good update. Looking into this year, just so you can see kind of where we are and continue to do things and continuing education. We're going to continue to do that with lake and streams, the green zone areas, and of course, lot planting assistance to the residents here. We're going to continue to manage the lakes and streams with fishery improvement. Streams are going to be monitored, stream bank restoration, and sediment solutions for the board. Also amenity maintenance, lake and wildlife will continue to maintain the hiking trails, the green and pollinator zones, and Sally Doss Nature Center fishing, and communicate to our partners progress of BTCI in our community. We continue to do that, that's our vision, that's our goals for the year. I'm gonna have people give short updates to you that are here from the committees on the executive board. First of all, we're gonna have fundraising, a little discussion on that in Tamarack Treasures, and Marietta, would you? Debbie, okay. As you know, Mary Aid and Debbie both share that area. So, Debbie? Just a couple of, of quick reminders from fundraising. Um, we're doing collections for spring Tamarack Treasures right now. That's on Mondays from 10.30 to 11.30 at the admin building. All you have to do is pull up in your car. We'll unload it, take care of it from then. We will also, thanks, John. We'll also be collecting uh, from 10.30 to 11.30 today after this meeting. We'll be here next month after this meeting from 10.30 to 11.30 if that is more convenient for the partners. Um, a reminder that we're not doing Christmas stuff right now. Um, if you could wait and donate that later in the year. Um, we're collecting Friday News again tells you all the things we are collecting. One update to that, we have said in the past that we're not taking clothing, but um, based on prior sales of clothing items, men's shirts are a big hit. So if you've got some quality men's shirts that you'd like to donate, 
we'll take those. Um, we are also looking for someone still to handle online sales for Tamarack Treasures. These are items that are too big for us to store, too big for us to manage, um, but really some lovely things. Some of it is housewares type things, dining room sets, sofas, etc. But we also have boats and kayaks and canoes um, that we can't store. We don't have the capacity to do that. We need someone that would manage that for us. What that really means is we'll take pictures, we send it to you, you post it on Facebook and next door and connect the buyer, potential buyer and the seller. We're not talking about a lot of hours here, um, but it would take a big burden off of specifically Mary Ada if someone could could handle that for us. Um, two other quick things, hanging baskets. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone that ordered hanging baskets. We sold 259 um, this year. They will be available for pickup on April 10th. So be looking for an email that you will be receiving from um, Marietta um, telling you the time that those are gonna be available for pick for pickup and let her know if you are not gonna be available to come during that time so we can make some kind of alternate arrangements for you. Um, lastly, I don't know about you guys, but on the days when it's been really warm, I've been itching to get outside and start planning. And my husband keeps saying, yeah, right, it's way too early. But first weekend of May is going to be a great time for you guys to start buying plants. Um, Whispering Springs partners with Bentry every year. Um, they very generously make available for two days, that Friday and Saturday, the first weekend, for us to come and purchase from them. 10% of all sales goes to Lake and Wildlife. So um, if you start making your list of items that you want, Whispering Springs is a great place to buy them that first weekend. Um, also be on the lookout for an email that will be coming. Um, we staff, help staff Whispering Springs that weekend. It's two hour shifts, it's a lot of fun. You don't have to know anything about plants. We basically help people load stuff in their cars and water plants and make stuff pretty for the nursery while we're there. So. Um, Anyhow, look out for that uh, email. It'll be coming, um, and we'd love to have you join that, that team. Thanks. Thanks, Deb. Um, keep Bentry beautiful. Um, of course, it's Andy, and uh, Andy's got his daughters coming in today, and Marietta. I'm just going to mention um, shortly that, as you know, there's a lot of work going on from time to time, and uh, at uh, various places, Andy keeps his teams going and uh, we'll continue to do that. But the one thing that was big, I think it's big, is that normally uh, on your Bentry invoice for the year, you'll see that KBTV donation, and you can donate so much money. Uh, and normally over a year or so, uh, probably 1,200, 1,500. Uh, at this point, and I've not verified the latest catch, but uh, Andy is just excited. There's been over $2,100 donated for us for KBTV. So thank you very much. That's very nice. In regard to wildlife, um, I didn't see Eldon come in today. I know he's been in and out, but uh, I always want to mention in the wildlife area that, of course, there's plenty of deer out here. On the way here this morning, I counted 27 of them uh, between my house and here. Uh, as you also know, the bears are out. Uh, they've come out of their semi-hibernation, and uh, we're going to hear more about that with Gerald. And uh, so they're up and around, so beware, be, you know, careful. Um, and also, uh, as you know, in the wildlife area, Rick has put a little uh, item out there on the Facebook for Bentry and uh, ask people to let him know if they see mammals, animals, uh, no squirrels. Uh, <laughs> Other than deer, other than deer, <laughs> okay, we're refining that. Turkeys, yep. yeah, and uh, that, that'll give us good information, what's going on, where, when, and uh, so please, please send that to Rick. That, uh, picture, when, where, uh, that'll be very helpful. The other thing that Eldon's done, if you haven't heard, is he, He's put the uh, beacons back out for the geese down near the uh, beach. Uh, those lights that go off and on when the geese get near, and they are working, so they're back out. Moving on, lake and streams. Uh, where is Huff? Huff's here. How about a little update, Huff? I know you said you keep it short, but come on. Thanks, Brian. Um, Brian and I sort of separate our duties on lake and stream. Um, He's the stream guy, I'm the, the fishing guy and the lake guy. So 
Um, the fishing in the lake this winter has been actually very good. Um, it's a whole different technique to catch fish in the winter in the lake than there is during the spring and summer. Mostly the fish are deeper, they're, they're a little bit more lethargic, the water's colder, and the techniques are a little different. We've got eight feeders. Uh, we have another feeder coming in, making it our ninth feeder. Um, the feed um, will start around the 1st of April when the water temperature is around 60 degrees, and that's when the, f the fish start actually feeding again because the water temperature allows their system to start wanting to f feed again. Um, we, um, uh, we are doing uh, for a youth fest this week, or this year, um, we're going to have a fishing with Huff, and that, what that's going to be is, we're, I have six or seven uh, good fishermen here at the Bent Tree that are going to contribute their time to take a child fishing. We're going to meet at nine o'clock. We're going to fish for a couple of hours, which I think is maybe their their time frame for keeping attention, and um, <laughs> we're going to. Uh, and the ages are ten to fifteen. Um, and um, we're going to teach them how to tie knots, lures to use, how to release fish in a healthy manner, and we're going to also harvest some fish, have a fish fry after we come in, and um, the parents and grandparents who are coming to pick the children up uh, are invited to the fish fry as well. So it's going to be a circle of, of not only harvesting, releasing, teaching, but also enjoying the uh, benefits of catching some nice fish. Uh, so we're very active. In April uh, 1st, we are gonna shock the lake uh, to look at the health of the fish, look at the bait and how much bait is still there, uh, look at the um, population of the bluegill, and um, uh, then at that point, we'll know what we're gonna do to supplement the lake again this year. Um, and so uh, we've got a lot going on and looking forward to Youth Week particularly. Uh, if anybody here has a boat with an electric motor and would like to volunteer to take a child, uh, I think we're going to have more children that are going to sign up than we have captains. Right now we've got seven or eight. Let me know and uh, glad to have you participate. Thank you. Thanks, Huff. Great work out there. The lake is really doing well. Uh, and along with it, of course, the streams. I'll just give you a short update. The uh, streams are doing well. Our restoration at Coffee Creek down here is, is holding through all these rains and storms and holding back uh, any deterioration and erosion that would run into the lake. So that's good. We'll be doing the same thing on Mulligan and Mulligan Creek probably April and May. Uh, we will be doing a lot more work, but it'll be very similar. So that is doing well. The dissolved oxygen is high in the streams and in the lake. And uh, as Huff said, when it goes up, here comes the bass. And uh, so um, I won't give away his fishing secrets. But uh, anyways, uh, the, the oxygen is up, pH is up, uh, hydrogen, uh, clarity is good. Uh, of course, there's going to be some sediment, but not much at all. No nitrates, hardly any phosphates. So we have good stream entry and exit down off of... Uh, Memorial and uh, Long Swamp down there. Um, right now, I've only saw one one beaver in the, in the lake, and that was it. There was a number of them in different areas, and also down on Long Swamp on the exit down there, and uh, that one's gone. So we have good clarity, good water, and uh, so we're, we're in good shape. And as you know, uh, it's, it's better to have that, and that helps the fish. So uh, I'm going to move on to habitat conservation and uh, have Dara give us an update and Rick on education planting and the ad hoc committee. So just two quick things. Um, when you think about what you might want to get from Whispering Springs when that comes or what you're going to plant, um, we have created some lists and this is the beginning. These will evolve, they will be online. Um, keystone species, keystone plants are those that contribute in an outsized way. They, they make more of a contribution to the ecosystem than other plants do in terms of uh, pollinators and wildlife. And, and it was, um, there's lots of different organizations that have lists of them. This is kind of where they overlap. And we also have information here about things that we know grow in Ventry, because you see them on the roadsides. So that gives you a, 
uh, an indication that they can survive here. Um, you know, that the, the, the mint, um, Black Eyed Susan, these are plants that you see on the, on the roadside and they're, they're beautiful in a garden as well in your yard. So that's the keystone species list. And then the second list, um, <coughs> we uh, indicated what things are notable about these plants. Maybe they're thought to be particularly firewise, as we all have that on our minds more. They grow in the shade. They'll do well in a container. So those types of um, plants are, or those uh, things that are notable about them are listed as well on, on this plant list. So this is something that you can use to help. And we'll be working with Whispering Springs, and that's part of these lists too, that we think these are available. They won't always all be available at every place you might go, but these aren't plants that will be impossible to find in the, in the retail trade. So that's what these are here. Please feel free to, to take one. Um, March 9th, I think, the next Saturday, uh, from 10 to noon um, at the spillway, we'll have a, a work day to um, remove some of the small pine trees, and BTCI is going to come pick them up, so we'll have to get rid of them. Um, and uh, Japanese honeysuckle and privet. Few other invasives if they've started coming up that threaten to take over that beautiful space that we're going to be working to return that to a meadow environment. Um, not the dog run side of the spillway, but the other side of the spillway right across from Memorial Garden, where you may have noticed last year we had some uh, less mown dogs. Oh, hey, Denise, I didn't know you were here. You stuck in. Um, so, um, just, oh my God. Um, so next Saturday, please, if you have a few hours, come out and join us. Bring gloves, um, brakes, whoppers, and hopefully the weather will cooperate. Um, so I think that's that's all. Rick, did you have anything to add? No. All right. Great. Thank thanks. You, thanks, Sarah. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, communications. Uh, there, there you are again. I know. Just a oh. little bit of an update. Uh, well. Somebody said to me recently, nobody in the community knows what Lake and Wildlife is doing. Uh, <laughs> and it was all I could do not to come across the table. <laughs> because it's hard really hard to communicate um, through the Echo, through Friday News, with emails in, in these meetings. But um, anybody has uh, ideas about how to effectively communicate um, more or what kinds of things you want to know about what Lake and Wildlife is doing, please feel free to provide those suggestions, so always uh, up for ideas. Thanks, Tara. Special projects, um, we have um, Kevin O'Brien, who is not here today. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of guys here and gals that help him and help on these different projects. I can tell you that uh, uh, Art and others are, are involved and still involved working with Kevin to make sure these things move along. A couple of the priorities right now are an admin pad I call it cement pad down by the lower admin doors where we bring stuff in and out for tamarack treasures and store other items um, so that that's easier and, and more accessible. Um, the ADA dock is uh, still in the works uh, and that would be an extension uh, off of the uh, donated walkway down there at Sally Doss and a configuration of how that would work into where the present dock is or a different location. and. Uh, the uh, donor who donated so much uh, for that walkway is also willing to donate uh, a certain amount also for that walkway to the dock so that people that have ADA issues, a wheelchair, et cetera, can go from that walkway down and right out onto the lake on the dock. So um, that's still in the works and that's, that's a biggie. Obviously the other things that he does and continues to do, uh, maintaining the uh, uh, right away underneath the uh, power lines and so on to make sure you know we don't get a lot of high growth and problems there so that continues to be working also uh, special events Luann do you want to give a little update um, it will be a fish fry not a shrimp boil when we do it in uh, probably be in June Elton get it back with me on a date that works for his guys and um, don't forget tamarack treasures we have a bake sale so we'll need folks baking for the tamarack treasures we have the donuts and stuff here every every month if you ever want to do the donuts and coffee feel free to call us we'll give you the key and you can do it um <laughs> if you don't feel like we own it 
They definitely do. <laughs> um, and then um, we will do the employee lunch, and we usually do it in the cottage, but they might be doing some remodeling in there, so I, we might have to move it until fall. But usually we do it either in the spring or the fall, so it'll, we'll get that out later, and we everybody donates for that. But we don't have that set yet. Okay, great. Thanks, Louie. I appreciate it. All you do, even coffee and donuts this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> uh, trails. Just a quick update. Uh, quick update on the trails. <laughs> I can see everybody. Uh, Lisa and I are going to be blazing the new uh, Chesna Co-Trail system, and we're going to get some new trails in there. Good high visibility blazes out there. So people can learn the paths a little bit easier. Um, so that's one thing we got in the works. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, last weekend I got a call from Rick, who got a call from somebody about a dangerous tree over the Beaver Run Trail, and it was a, definitely a widowmaker. It was a pine tree about this big around that had broken off 30 feet up, and. We kind of were too dangerous for us to take down. I got a hold of Bent Tree uh, Maintenance and Grounds people, and they had the tree down by 9 o'clock Monday morning. So it was, it was definitely it was a work of art, the guy that took it down. I was very impressed <laughs> with the way he did it. Um, so I would like to point out that if anybody sees a tree like that on a trail, to get a hold of me, and we'll get it taken care of. Uh, another thing we had last year, on the Denny Ridge Trail, there turned out to be a yellow jacket's nest in the middle oh, of yeah. the trail. And as soon as we found out about that, we got it taken care of. Uh, so if anybody's interested, in, I try to walk all the trails at least once a month, but I don't always make it, I don't think. <laughs> I've had a lot of things going on for the last six months or so. And uh, if anybody would like to volunteer to walk a particular trail at least once a month and just report to me, and let me know what they see. If they see a dangerous tree, get that information to me and we'll get it taken down. We'll get it taken care of. Uh, so if anybody would like to volunteer for that, just please talk to me after the meeting. Thanks, sir. I'm sure we've got enough people here to volunteer. <laughs> yes. Last but not least, the treasurer's report, and um, we'll see if Denise can just give us a short report. Uh, I'll keep okay. it short. Uh, I'm Denise K., new treasurer, taking uh, filling the big shoes of Rick Patterson. At a high level, we started the year out with about $11,000 in our account, and we have a budget of improvements that we want to do projects and improvements at about twenty two thousand so as you can see our volunteer work and the fundraising that we have going on are really needed to make sure that we're able to fulfill those dreams of uh, keeping up the trails and, and the other projects so thank you in advance for all of the support either monetarily or for volunteer hours through the year we appreciate it. Thank you. Upcoming education that we're going to be doing uh, in April, Rick's going to give an overview of the Lake and Wildlife Vision Mission, some budgets, and also uh, some other information in May. Huff will have a biologist, a fish biologist, that will speak about fish in the lake. June, uh, NASA Skywatch Star Program and, and, and monitoring. Uh, there will be uh, someone here from NASA Skywatch, talk about the stars, talk about what's up there, how to view it, what to do. Uh, July, there is no meeting, uh, but we will be doing a lot of work with Youth Fest, as you know. Huff's doing fishing with Huff. I'll be doing the quality and stream monitoring, the Meet the Creek program. Uh, we're also going to have a program Dara's going to be doing this year on plants and habitat and, and plants that are edible by Mark Warren, which is going to be a walkthrough, which is going to be very good. So there's a lot of things going on that we're going to be doing education-wise and uh, helping others too. August, Lori Forrester, uh, she's our regional director for Adopt a Stream program, who teaches us, trains us. She's a certified trainer. Um, she'll be here to speak about streams and water quality and, and also about the whole Etowa River and Watershed We'll want to miss that. More to come. So, finally, 
uh, our speaker of the day, Gerald um, from Appalachian, Georgia, Friends of the Bears. Um, I'm going to tell you that Gerald is so happy to be here. Uh, he has a long history of work, uh, not only on the habitat and bears, but as you know, he's a lieutenant colonel retired. We thank you for your service. He's a 20-year vet veteran, 28-year veteran of the U.S. Army, former executive director of the Tennessee Overhill Heritage Association in Etowah. He is the founder of the Appalachia Georgia Friends of the Bears. He is the founder, whose mission is the reduction of bear-human conflict through proactive educational outreach programs, increasing public awareness about coexisting with bears and the use of human and bear deterrence and advocacy. I won't go into all the detail of his tours and his worldwide tours and work with the U.S. Army and his leadership and direction. I'm sure he'll be able to talk more to you about that. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's welcome Gerald Hodges. Thank you. Thank you. Already? Uh, thank you for uh, Brian Vassar, Rick Patterson, Dara Sinclair, and Barbara Collier for having me. Uh, this is the largest audience I've had since October 20, uh, 2020 when I uh, spoke to the Six International Human Bear Conflict Workshop in South Lake Tahoe, Nevada. I had about 293 uh, bear experts, way more than I am, uh, from across the world, and I spoke to them about our use of social media and uh, educating humans, and all the government employees started getting real uncomfortable real quick because they hate dealing with the public. They, they want to do their little, their little, their little lane, and then they want to, then they want to just go away. But uh, yeah, you talking about scared, terrified looks? It'd be like the normal person seeing a bear. So it, it was it, actually it was pretty funny. Um, are there any elected any elected officials here? Uh, Georgia DNR employees or contractors? Uh, HOA board members. Okay, I got a slide for you. Law enforcement, any law enforcement folks? Okay, and any media folks? None, okay, all right. I just wanna level the playing field when I, when I <laughs> talk to folks. Um, I, afterwards, I'll be in the back at the table, just, and if you wanna ask me questions back there, some people don't ask in an open forum, or you can email me afterwards, we'll have my email address up here later on. Uh, to ask questions. Uh, any of the printed material on the table in the back is free. Please don't take my other crew to my because that's, you know, what we do when we have a table event. Uh, I saw the thing about the NASA thing. Look up Ursa Major and Ursa Minor and the stories, uh, stories about uh, uh, how they became, came about, the, uh, the Greek legend, if you will. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry you're going to see me Occasionally look at my phone. It's not just to keep me on track of time, but I'm expecting my fourth grandchild today. So, uh, yeah, and it's been, it's been a rough labor so far. So uh, that, that's, that's when I look at stuff. Um, as I flip through the slides, oh, there we go. Uh, as I flip through the slides, there are going to be some busy slides because usually, you know, sometimes i got bigger screen and stuff like that. Um, lower right-hand side of, this, of the screen, or, of the screen normally, or depending on the layout of the slide, it might be in the middle, it would be a number. So if you want to come back at the end, please hold your questions to the end. If you want me to come back to it to ask a question, just make sure to put that in your memory. Your memory. Uh, this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about bearwise basics. Uh, we're going to talk about HOAs, POAs real quick. Uh, basic bear biology and capabilities. Uh, past threats, current threats to bears in Appalachia, Georgia. Uh, some outdoor quick safety stuff, again, for bearwise, and I'll tell you more about bearwise in a minute. We'll, then we'll do a conclusion. You're going to see me switch back and forth uh, quite a bit. Uh, this is me <laughs> to, to prove that I am a tree hugger. <laughs> um, this is the Gannett Poplar. It's in, on the Bear, uh, Bear Creek Trail in West Gilmer County. It, is, it takes me five of me to reach around that. It's an old poplar tree. It's old, when, when Columbus came to, uh, to the, this side of the planet, he was, uh, that tree was already old. So it's a 600 plus year old tree. Um, but you know, I, 
I'm, I'm from North Georgia and Southeast Tennessee. My mom's side of the family is from North Georgia. Uh, my dad's side is from Southeast Tennessee. I grew up just north of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Went, uh, went into the Army four years as enlisted infantryman, came, came out, went back, uh, went to college at UT Chattanooga, got commissioned as an armor officer, uh, spent a number of years as an armor guy, and then I became a strategist, one of supposedly 250 smart people in the, in the, in the Army to, to do strategy. So uh, I did that for a few years, got out, settled back near my hometown. Uh, I settled in Athens, Tennessee for five, six years, and then I moved, moved to North Georgia. And uh, while I was in Tennessee, I was the uh, executive director of the Tennessee Overhill Heritage Association, which is a nonprofit that promotes cultural tourism in Polk, Monroe, and Main, Main Counties at the southeast corner of Tennessee. Um, and I also owned the railroad, so I got to play with I had a part, my partner was Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum, so I got to play with a 47 mile long uh, train for five years, which uh, I didn't do get to do all the cool stuff. I got the calls of, hey, there's a beaver that's built a dam and it's flooded six acres of my property, or there's two donkeys as we were going down the, down the, down the railroad and, and they shouldn't be, children shouldn't have to watch that. So <laughs> that's the kind of calls I got. Um, my first experience with bears, uh, it was in Athens, Tennessee on what's called the Eureka Trail in 20, uh, August 2014. I was walking my two geriatric German Shepherds down the, ro uh, down the trail and I had, um, I had a moment leash and I saw something black go across the trail and two little black things doing this. And it was coming out of a neighborhood. I thought it was the Great Pyrenees. but. As, as I started doing, rolling through my mind, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a Great Pyrenees and it wasn't a wild pig. I was like, oh crap, those are, that's a bear, which we weren't supposed to have bears. You know, when I was growing up, all the bears were in Gatlinburg. They weren't in Southeast Tennessee. So um, that was my first lesson of, and especially being in tourism, it was important for me because a few years before that, we had a, a child that was killed by a bear in Polk County, Tennessee. Uh, so I got spun up on bears real quick. Um, one of those bears that I saw the next year, actually that was August, so June, is that little booger right there. That's a yearling and it was family breakup time. Mama, and we'll talk about family breakup more here, here in a few minutes. Of course, this is scat. And then this is what caused me and my wife to, to found the Appalachia Georgia Friends of the Bears. Uh, we were kept seeing roadkill. I live in Cherry Log. We kept seeing roadkill, kept seeing roadkill. No one seemed to know what to do with them or anything like that. And I said, finally, enough of this. So this was Sunday morning. I went out to it in my church clothes. And, I, and I, the next morning I said, we're going to do something about it. And we, that's when the 3rd of June uh, 2019 was when we for, formed the organization. So uh, real quick of our key accomplishments last year. Last year was a slow, a slow year for us a little bit because uh, my wife was diagnosed this time last year with breast cancer. She beat it. She didn't have to go through chemo. It was called early. Ladies, get your get the girls checked out, please. Um, that's and that's what that's what saved her life uh, and saved all the other bad things that have have to happen to, to get cleared up. Um, so. Uh, I do table events all the time and uh, throughout the year, and we'll talk more about those in a few minutes. And um, I do events like this. I talk to about 2,000 plus people a year on, on trying, most of them tourists, most of them coming up from Florida, Metro Atlanta area. So uh, our mission statement, uh, it's pretty clear. This is our area of operation, what I use a military term for, there, throw that out there. Uh, this black line around the Appalachia, Georgia area, uh, that's what we claim to be responsible for, 26 counties. This darker green area is the primary range of the American black bear in North Georgia. Uh, the lighter area is the secondary. This is getting pushed out. As we go along, the bears are getting, they continue to expand. We have about 3,000 bears in Appalachia, Georgia. Uh, this, of course, are continuing to put, push down south and out. Uh, of course, the other bears in the other states are doing the same thing. So there's, there's some, hopefully, there's going to be some more genetic diversity because right now, 
the bears in south, the southern Appalachian Mountains are the least genetic diverse of all the black bears in the United States. Um, and there's a reason for that. We, I may hit that here in a minute. Um, there are small, smaller populations of black bears in Georgia, down here around Macon. There's about a population of about 500. And then, um, and then down here, of course, in the Oak, Okefenokee Swamp area, uh, there's another population of about 500 bears. Now, these bears um, uh, up in our area, uh, they are, um, well, I'll, I'll come back here in a minute. We'll continue on. I don't want to get bogged down into the one slide. Disclaimer, bears are wild animals. Never, please never approach a bear. They don't want to be held, hugged, or handled. <laughs> although, I, although, ladies, I know what y'all do because my wife doesn't have to talk her out. Of, I have to talk her out every, down every once in a while. They don't want to be held, hugged, or handled. I lo we love them. When these days, you know, I, I'm a Christian. The Bible talks about bears and talks about the new heaven and the new earth. And it talks about bears specifically in there. So just we're going to be able, we'll be able to play with them later on. It's just, <laughs> so respect the bear. Um, it's a general agreement of uh, wildlife, uh, wildlife folks. The, there is no, we don't consider, we don't use the terminology pro problem bear, nuisance bear anymore. It's really nuisance and problem humans because the, the actions that we take or fail to take are what puts the bears into, um, uh, puts the bears into uh, harm's way. Unfortunately, what we do cost them their, often will cost them their lives. Uh, bad human behavior begets bad bear behavior, and uh, we have a bad human problem. Um, this is something I, as I was philosophizing, being philosophical a couple years ago, um, let me tell you, it's easier to kill than it is to try to preserve a life. How many people think bears kill humans all the time? Okay. If you watch TV, if you watch the news, if you watch Hollywood stuff, bears are killing human beings all the time. Since 1970 in North America, of all the bear, you know, black bears, polar bears, and brown bears, also known as grizzlies in North America, there's only been 144 humans killed by bears. Okay. Now I had this. I call this my comparable slide because I, I show people this and say, okay. This is what, this is other things that kill humans and we don't seem, it doesn't seem to bother us anymore. Okay, fatal dog attacks. This is up to 2022, 2010 to 2022, 619 people in the United States, mostly elderly and children. Uh, automobile fatalities, 2016 to 2022, 10,553 in the state of Georgia. Uh, Fannin, Gilmer, Murray, Whitfield, and Walker counties from 2019 to 2021, 170 people. Um, homicides, uh, uh, 2023 alone in the city of Atlanta, 131 homicides. Uh, Chicago, Illinois, uh, last year was 617 people. When I was in, when I was in Iraq, I went to Iraq and to support uh, General Petraeus and, and multiple national force Iraq. His staff. Uh, I went there with a bunch of logisticians to do some, do some uh, planning for the withdrawal in 2008. We were already planning withdrawal from Iraq and Afghanistan. And one of the metrics that we used was the number of deaths, the number of killed and wounded, if you will, in the city of Chicago. So when, when the number of people got less than that in Iraq and Afghanistan, that's when we started Started withdrawing and started draw, doing the drawdown, if you will. Except, except we know what Af Af Afghanistan is a whole different ball of wax. Uh, 2010 was the highest, uh, ha highest amount of casualties in Iraq. That was, I'm sorry, in Afghanistan, that was 498 killed in action. And of course, hot car deaths. That just infuriates me, apparently, leave a kid in a car. Uh, Bearwise. Bearwise was formed in 2018 by. 13 uh, charter members, and when I say charter members, it was wildlife agencies. Georgia DNR was one of them. So these rules that I'm talking about with Bearwise, that's also the rules that Georgia DNR goes by. I selected them to use these rules too because I want to make sure there's a strategic message, a uniform strategic message that's going out. Uh, when, we, when I'm talking and when DNR talking, we're, we're synchronized on what we say. 
They've got the scientists, they've got the money, they've got the wildlife biologist. I don't have that. So we use that. Um, biggest, uh, of course, we've already talked about their feeder approach bears. Secure the food, garbage, and recycling. And of course, remove bird feeders, folks. I'm telling you, the bird feeders is, is garbage, two thirds human bear conflict. The rest of it's wildlife feeders, bird feeders in, in neighborhoods like this. Clean your grills and store, store your grills away, your, your fish fryers, all that stuff. Bears smell 2,000 times better than humans. Anybody ever watch uh, Animal, uh, Animal House, but uh, Blues, Blues Brothers? Yeah, so my, I had a friend of mine do this cartoon. Um, again, I'm, I'm a Catholic Christian, and um, this right here, and I, and I do our, our, our church's uh, creation ministry, Pride, number one, number one deadly sin, and then of course these everybody talks about pronouns. I mean my mine, okay. It's my property. I'll do what I want. I want my grandchildren to see the see the deer or see the bear. I I me me. Oh man, I hear it all the time. So um, and then we talk about birds. Remember this verse is in in the Gospels two or three times. God feeds the birds, and he feeds the other stuff, too. We just need to let, let, let him handle that kind of stuff. Um, stash the trash, of course. This is, I take, the, the, unless it's labeled something different, a lot of these pictures, are, most of these pictures are mine. Uh, that's, that's a borrowed, if a bear gets inside a vehicle, it's going to tear it apart. They smell stuff easily. This is our first project. Uh, we got the second bear crossing signs in, in the state of Georgia. They're between LJ and Blue Ridge. I did a, I did a study, a, a bear, bear roadkill study, and we were able to do that. Uh, don't preach, of course, uh, dogs. We're going to talk a lot about dogs. Dogs, are, uh, dogs and humans are a problem uh, do, with, with relationship to bears. Homeowners associations, um, I have an article that you may want to read because homeowners associations, if they don't have take measures to prevent accidents, if you will, um, they could be held liable and then you stick on top of that, they're letting humans feed animals and create a dangerous condition. If something happens, they can be, they can be liable. Individuals, the same thing on the back of our brochure, I have a little block back there, uh, it talks about that. And uh, if, it's, if the situation is bad enough, if you're found civilly liable, you also could be criminally charged uh, for manslaughter. Mmm, this is the fun part. Uh, see those little blue eyes? They, it's a few, about four months, and their eyes go from blue to, blue to brown. Don't think you're going to outrun, clout, climb, out, swim a bear. They can, they can do it all and leave you in the dirt. Uh, they smell 2,000, 2000 times better than humans. they 300 times better than a bloodhound. So what, the way it's described to me by one of my mentors, he said, Gerald, imagine this is a can of baked beans. The bear can smell the perfume on the woman who canned these baked beans in the factory. That's how good, that's how good they can smell. They're opportunistic feeders. If they can eat it, they'll eat it. I'm not saying if they see you, they're going to jump on you and eat you. That's not necessarily the case. What, but if they find food, you know, human-provided food, whether it's actively or passively, they're going to eat it. Um, in the fall, from September until November, they go through what's called hyperphagia. That's the time of year they're getting ready for the wintertime. And a, and a 250-pound bear has to eat 20,000 calories a day to put that kind of weight on. How much is that? Well, if it's a, you have a pound of acorns, think about the acorns up front. I was noticing that when I was coming in this morning, that uh, a pound of those ha has about 2,100 calories in it. Okay. Now, now uh, the American chestnut, which there's a few still out there, they have about 9,000 calories in a pound. So one of the things that we advocate for, and you're hearing me talk briefly more about that here in a little while, is we're members of the American Chestnut uh, Foundation. We want the restoration of the American chestnut back on the American landscape where it belongs. So that's one of, the, one of our side things that we work with, with, work with others on. We, and we encourage other people to do too. 
Okay, I'm gonna need my corner for this one. Okay, these cubs, these are, these are cubs. All American blackberry cubs are born within a week or two of January the 22nd. So from about January the 8th until about February the 15th, that's the window the vast majority of the American blackberry cubs are born. Okay, these were, these were mom and three cubs. She had the cubs underneath a cabin outside Sevierville, I think it was, Sevierville, Tennessee. Uh, the home, somebody smelt gas, homeowner, they were absentee uh, uh, owners. They came in and looked at, uh, they asked, hey, when you, we need somebody to look at underneath the, the cabin because we got a gas leak. And the person starts going in there and mama comes out. Oh. Well, hu bear smell, uh, smell, bear cubs sound like human children. When they cry, they are loud. And they, you know, you, people send, uh, they, they sent D, a TWRA, Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency came in got Appalachia Bear Rescue involved. They got the, bear, they got the cubs, took them, and, and started taking care of them. The gas leak was fixed. Mom came back, which normally doesn't happen. So they were able to reunite the cubs with mom. Uh, there's a video on it. I may, I may reshare that on our Facebook page in the next several days. So watch our Facebook page, and, I'll, and I can re uh, you'll see the, the video when they're sticking them through the, the vent and mom is grabbing them. From, 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 the, uh, from the TWRA guys and ABR folks. Um, so right now, we're right here. They're still in den. Um, and the moms with cubs that have been born this year, they'll stay in den until about the middle of April to the end of April. Now, right now, we're already, see, we're already seeing uh, the, ma the uh, adult males and the sub-adults come out. They're the first ones to come out. Especially as the weather gets warmer, they're going to be more active. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. so once they come out, they're going to start going, they're going to start at looking for food and we'll talk about food here in, in on the next, I think it's the next slide. Okay. Uh, and then that's the first, they'll stay with mom to, for the first year. So that first you'll go to January, they'll go to, they'll go through Denon again and then family breakup takes place. Now at, at that point, they're 16 months old. Mom comes in estrus or heat, and it's time for her to start a new family, okay? When she does that, she will chase those, she will chase those yearlings at that point. They'll, she'll chase them away, and they'll go start life on their own. Now, when they're born, they're about the same size and weight as a can of soda. That's the reason I got a can of RC Cola back there on the, on the back table. That's about how big they are. Now, when they leave ne uh, next year, late June, early, uh, uh, I'm sorry, late May, early June, they'll be about 75 pounds at that point, okay? So, um, you know, they depend on mom. They'll, give, they'll be nursed until, when they're, the ones that are born this year, they'll continue to nurse on mom until July. And then that's when she starts weaning them because um, the berries and stuff starts coming in. So that's really their, their, first, their first solid food. Um, mom, go back to mom coming in estrus or heat. She'll chase, she'll chase the, uh, the young, the, uh, the male has to go away. That's God's way of taking care of interbreeding. If she's got enough food sources, she may share a piece of her range with a daughter. So that's, that's normally how that works. Um, hyperphagia, we talked briefly about that earlier. It's time they start, have to start getting ready to, to put on the weight. They have to start getting ready to put on the weight. Black bears have what's called a delayed implantation. Mom is going to have multiple suitors. Um, and uh, she can have cubs by different dads, and she, she once she's inseminated, those those they call blastocysts. They're not quite embryos yet. They float around her system, and then they will implant in her. They'll implant in her in November if she's got enough body fat and she's healthy. Then they'll implant in her system. Sixty days gestation time. That's the reason when the cubs are born. You know these are these are a month old. They've got their fur, but when they're born, they don't have fur. Their eyes are closed and their ears closed. They the eyes don't open and the ears don't open until about the, the, about the two plus month mark. So then their eyes will start opening and they'll start becoming more active in the den. Let's see anything else here. Uh, mortality for cubs is about fifty about twenty five percent for the first the first year and about 25% the second year. Foods. Now they can eat, they can eat, you know, they can eat this stuff throughout the year, but this is what normally is 
the big, the big stuff that they they start eating. Uh, poplar leaves, when the, pop, the poplar leaves way up high, when you're walking in the woods, don't just walk look on the ground, look up in the trees. Because, you know, they're, they're kind of monkeys. They stay in the trees a lot. <laughs> a lot more than what a lot of humans uh, expect. So when those, those poplar leaves start coming out, they'll, uh, uh, they like, they're nice and tender and tasty. They'll, eat, they'll sell up there and eat those. Uh, grasses, forbs, insects, and larvae. We're going to talk about that, more about that in a minute. Rodents, reptiles, carrion. Carrion's dead stuff. A lot of people don't know what carrion is. It's dead stuff. So any kind of winter kill, road kill, anything like that, they're going to go to it. Uh, De Deuteronomic, uh, Deuteronomic diet laws, bears are unclean animals. Oh, by the way. Um, ungulates. Our ungulates are deer. A white-tailed deer. Uh, late May to early July, they'll be in their bed phase for five to, t five to eight days. When the, when the mama has the, the fawn, it can't really go anywhere for about five to eight days. So mom is, uh, you know, uh, uh, bear smell it, and it's one, another way to keep the deer population down. Uh, this is uh, eastern skunk cabbage or squaw, squaw root, the politically incorrect term is called squaw, squaw root. Uh, they, the bears will find that and eat it. It helps open them up after being in, in den. Um, you know, to yeah, it cleans them out. So, you know, they, there's a lot of detail there, but it, it, it cleans them out. Um, also, uh, in, during their, while they're in den, they'll lose their, their pads, not the whole, you know, beady part, but, you know, kind of shed the skin, ends of the skin on their pads. They lose that during uh, part of the denning process. One of the other reasons they, they kind of have to go dormant for a little while because their feet's kind of tender. Um, okay, so all soft mass. This is soft mass crops here. Sorry, uh, all of this stuff starts coming in to, to season, and they find it and they'll eat it. Of course, hard mass acorns. Acorns, acorns is the big thing here. Uh, of course, different parts of the country you have different things, but the biggest part, of course, South Georgia got South Georgia got pecans. But um, all this stuff, it, they've got to have it. If, if, if you have, we have a hard mass year, like we had 2022. The roadkill, I had to deal with 19 roadkill that year. Uh, last year, we had a decent, a decent hard mass crop. I only had nine roadkill that I dealt with, that I got called about. Of course, again, for all practical purposes, the American chestnut is extinct. Uh, so this, this is on my property. This log, last, this is last, uh, earlier last year. This log was right here, uh, old pine tree got not got blown down, and I cut it down for safety. Left the stuff there, insects, lots of insects. The bear flipped that into the water and, and ate the insects. Uh, I have beaver on. Uh, I live on about a seven-acre lake, man-made lake, and um, the beaver are beaver. And uh, I have wrapped my trees. I will not kill a beaver, so I've wrapped 80 uh, trees with wire. And the, this was ants that were carpenter ants were up in the tree, and of course you had you know pine needles, and they built a you know built a nest there. Uh, this squashed down is what the bear did to get to the to get to the uh, the ants. Um, if you have drains that have the pipe right here, you see the drain pipe coming off your gutters and stuff, or coming out from your foundation, buy a two fifty a two dollar fifty cent cap to put on the end of that because critters you know reptiles and uh, reptiles and uh, rodents get up in there and when they do the bear goes after them and he, he this bear is shredded this that's the only thing that shredded that pipe like that so it dug out a, this was all you know buried and it ripped it up apart and went into it and got evidently got the rodent or whatever it was um, also, if you're going through the woods, you see a big dugout spot. The only thing that digs out big uh, spots to go after yellow jackets' nests is a bear. Now, uh, skunks will go in after them, but their area that they make is not as near as big as a near as big as a what a bear does. This right here is uh, the moss along a driveway. You see that kind of flip back, flip, flip, flip. That's the bear in the springtime flipping it back, getting getting the insects. Uh, some of these, uh, you probably, uh, maybe uh, uh, Dora sent out. Um, 
you see this is on my property you got the uh got the wire right there um this is one camera on one side of the trail and then up the trail back in there is it took this picture right here so when you see two bears like this what theme music should i have in my in my head uh a the georgia bulldogs fight song uh ozzy osbourne's crazy train uh select your barry white song all, none of the above or all of the above what should what what should it be barry white barry white, white is correct uh, so, uh, bears are dimorphic, sexually dimorphic means the males are bigger than the females. Uh, and this is in June the 10th, right? At the beginning of breeding season. This is a female, and back behind it's a male. And uh, it's interesting because, we'll, I think we'll see it in the next slide. Uh, our bears don't have, a lot of them don't have brown muzzles and any quite, kind of white blaze. So, we normally don't, we don't normally don't see that. But uh, this camera kept clicking pictures, and I could tell exactly the height of them by the way they're, by the way they are by the wire. The between that log and that was only that that big. So this one's got a white blaze. The male's got a white blaze, and also a partially brown muzzle. Okay, uh, a bear looks to uh, wants to look its best. Many humans want them to uh, look their best too. When you see a, ma a bear with matting hair loss or some blood on its hips or flanks, what is your first reaction? A, get a grooming comb and attempt to, <laughs> attempt to comb it out. Um, call George DNR because the bear appears to have mange. Uh, or C, uh, just say poor bear. Or D, none of the above. Or E, some of the above. What do you do? Huh? B, no. No. C. C, just say poor bear. Um, now, imagine me trying to explain this to an 80-year-old little granny, or actually I've done it to two, three grannies before. Breed season. Breeding season, this area, one, bears molt. Their hair starts, you know, here, you know, after about April, the hairs are going to start, you know, coming off, and it's going to look, it's going to look awful. Uh, it looks mad at you know when they're scratching this stuff. It's it's one to mark ter mark their range, but number two is to get the hair off. So because it, it, it's you know the summer hair is coming in. So in summertime or during breeding season, the males are behind and they grab a hold of this area, grab a hold of this area. Okay, one it can be rubbed off because they're they're doing their normal scratching and stuff. Two when you start seeing like it's kind of raw and bloody. It's, it's because of the act. <laughs> okay? Remember multiple males, mul yeah, multiple cubs, yeah. Without getting too graphic. Um, you see these three cubs in front yard, what do you do? Rush out to take a picture for social media? <laughs> Call George DNR and tell him you have three orphan cubs in your yard? Uh, call your call your neighbors and tell them not to interact with them and put your dogs up. B D, none of the above. C, e, some of the above. C, please, yeah, C, please put your dogs up. Please don't interact with them because what happens is, when the bears are so small and when they come out then they're going to be out, they're going to be about five pounds or a little bit more, not much. They're only about that big, as you can see from this picture up here. Um, Mom has to put them up a baby, what we call a babysitter tree. She's got to go. She's got to go forage because she remember she's lactating. She's got to have energy for herself to feed them. So she goes out for a couple of hours, going around looking for food. Now, unfortunately, she's in a neighborhood in Guillermo County when this is this happens. But the lady listened to me. This is during COVID. The lady listened to me, and no one interacted with them. They went all the way around. Um, Georgia does not have a rescue, nor do they participate in the Appalachia Bear Rescue in Tennessee. If somebody went out and interacted with those bears, those cubs, mom wouldn't come back. And then, then if, they're, if they're orphaned before the May the 31st, they're euthanized, okay? So that's, that's the stakes that we're looking at, okay? Please don't interact with them. 
Um, real quick, except for uh, during hyperphagia, bears should be active at nighttime. You'll see a lot of my pictures in here are at night. Um, during, during hyperphagia, they're eating 20 hours a day. Okay, um, human provided food. Human provided food throws the bears off biologically. If they're eating human provided food, it boosts their caloric intake up and it makes them more fertile. So normally you'd have one to three bears. Normally you have one to three bears um, per, you know, when a sow has them. What we're finding is areas that they're uh, interacting with humans a lot, they're having four and five cubs. Okay, so they, uh, the North Carolina DNR folks started a, started a study about two years ago, three years ago. It's supposed to be one year, expanded to two years. Now they've expanded to three years because they're seeing they're seeing a, a definite cycle of this. They're also having uh, so they don't they don't the, the females don't become sexually mature till they're about four to five years old. They're seeing that. They're, they're about two years, two and a half years old, they're becoming sexually active, mm -hmm. uh, sexually mature, if you will. Same way with humans. So the other, the other thing that we're finding is they don't know if it's the hormones in our food that they're eating that's making them more just the caloric intake or it's also the hormones in our food. And it screws human children up too. Our, if you didn't know, because of the hormones in our food, the, uh, human females are becoming more sexually mature at an earlier age also. Um, Black bear myths, um, bears don't hibernate. Bears, bears have to hibernate for a certain amount of time. I've already touched on it a little bit. Uh, three things that put them into to, to torpor or, or hibernation as some people call it, ambient temperature drops, ambient light, days get shorter, and the lack of natural food. I'm doing this, lack of natural food. Remember the teacher stopping when the question's gonna be on a test? The reason why is they have to, they, um, uh, if they have access to human provided food, their body tells them it short circuits it and says, hey, you don't have to go to sleep. You got plenty of food. Why not relocate the bear? If you relocate the bear, it's gonna find its way back home. They have a huge, they have a huge um, uh, homing, rehoming uh, ability. So, and on the next slide, I'll show you, I'll show you that, the, how it, it really, they go many, many miles. You remove the, uh, if you don't remove the human provided food, they're gonna still come, they're gonna still come back. You're still gonna have the problem of, a bear, a problem of bears in the area. Brutus, if you uh, read, uh, uh, read Kim uh, Lo Delosier's uh, book, uh, Bear in the Back Seat, this is uh, Bear 75, he talks about it. I just put it on a slide. Uh, over three years, they relocated this bear 10 times from the uh, Georgia, Tennessee state line all the way up into uh, uh, what, uh, Jefferson and Washington National Parks, uh, National Forest, and he found his way back every time to Cades Cove, his same, his same, his same campground. <laughs> Ultimately, his last time he was killed in Unicoi co uh, County, Tennessee, uh, by a poacher. Past threats, I'll do this real quick. Um, colonial fur trade, uh, deforestation, habitat loss. I've got classes that go into depth on all these if you ever want to be bored. Um, you know, I, I, teach, I teach these to college uh, up until this last year. I taught them to college classes. Um, American chestnut, we talked about that. Unregulated hunting. Hunting wasn't regulated until 1920 uh, in the state of Georgia. And then, uh, then they finally started having a hunting season in 1982, I think it was. Current threat. Overdevelopment. This is uh, all the counties of Appalachia, Georgia. You see the blue line and the red line? As you can see, it does, it does nothing but go up. Um, when they finish the four lane, if you will, Georgia Highway 515, it just, woo, it went up even more because it was easier access up here. Um, in 1945-ish, there was only an estimated population of 50 bears in North Georgia, Appalachia, Georgia, and then it, sl it slowly began to increase to what we've got today. Pickens County. Uh, human population, this is just to take that, pick this count of it and show you what, what it has. It does nothing but go up to. Oh, and oh, by the way, uh, that was not, that's 2020 for the federal census. Uh, it's increased even more since then. 
Um, acorn trees, every time we knock an acorn tree down, it takes to replace it, it takes 20, 30 years for it to start producing acorns. Two thirds of all human bear conflicts, trash related. Uh, tourism is a blessing and a curse too. Uh, you look at Gatlinburg, look at Fannin County, and we'll talk about Fannin County in a little bit, and Helen, Georgia. Um, lots of money, you know, as they say, money talks, everything else walks. Um, Pickens County tourism. Um, of 26 counties, Pickens County is number 20 on as far as tourism goes in, in Appalachia, Georgia. It's not big, not that big of a, uh, a deal. So I got that up there. And then uh, this is some of the shenanigans I see. Bear resistant trash can, $270, but if you don't close it, it don't work. It's a bear resistant trash can. <laughs> a, uh, a job box often used as a bear resistant trash can. That's uh, $560. It doesn't help if you don't put a latch on the hasp. <laughs> uh, this is my trash can. It's got a chain and, and of course it's closed. Uh, I don't know about here, but we have trash dudes, dudes that pick up trucks that pick up trash. I also have a road that we pick up uh, in Gilmer County that we are continually getting trash off, off of because this stuff flies out. Um, and then of course you, you see those pic other pictures. Uh, Pickett's County supposedly has 90, only 95 short-term rentals. That's what the county was telling me. I did a I did an open records request. Seems awful low to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, that's what they gave me. It's like, this is what we got. That's what we get taxes from. Well, I can tell you, Fannin County and Gilmer County both each have over 2,000. So, and it's an issue. And I got to address the Gilmer County Board of Directors about it the other day because we're going up with a, 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 they're doing an ordinance or putting together an ordinance, and I wanted bear resistant trash cans put, on, put in on the ordinance. Um, trash. Um, you know, a lot of detail here. All of our tourists come from Metro Atlanta and Florida. Pretty much, except for a little, little bit from Birmingham, Alabama. I don't know why it's about Birmingham. I've been there once, I didn't like it, so maybe that's the reason why they're coming up here. Um, I, some more shenanigans here you see with the trash. Um, you've heard of COVID, you've heard of uh, H1, H1, uh, H1, H1N1. Those of you who are bird folks, birders or anything like that, you should be intimately familiar with that. One of my jobs uh, as a strategist is I was the pandemic disease planner when I was at, when Joint Forces Command in Norfolk, Virginia existed. Um, I'm intimately familiar with it. It kills bears. It kills bears. And that's just the ones that uh, the biologists were able to find year, year before last. Bears eat garbage, carrion, bird seed, and wildlife food. Guess what? When birds get on your wildlife, here's what they do. They, they drink your water and they dookie, you, right? And bears get up there and go, ah, ah, ah. Yeah. so when they do that, they can they can track they can track avian influenza very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID, we know COVID's killed bears and uh, other critters and zoos and in the wild also. So this is a big thing. It's not necessary yet, but it will be here pretty soon. Oh, okay. I'm almost almost done. No, that was the my time my warning. <laughs> Please slow down. Please slow down. Um, this is last year's death toll, if you will. Gilmer County is, of course, five. Fannin, Pickens, Pickens is two, and Dawson County. That, that was the ones from this last year. Only nine, thank God. That's, this is shenanigans in Pickens County. Pickens County is one of my, probably my worst county because I've got, I'm, you use nice words. <laughs> I got people some somewhere, especially up in here in the Talking Rock area, they're cutting the paws off of bears. <laughs> so I only had this happen in Gilmer County once, but all the other bears that are getting. I'm, I come, when I get to the roadkill, people will come and cut their cut their paws off. The last, the latest one was Christmas Eve this last year. Um, that is this one. And then la the year before, no, it's this one. And the year before uh, last was uh, 2022, yeah, was an adult male that they were able to get only one paw off of because the other one was underneath it. They didn't want to touch it because it, I guess it was icky. It had been there for a day or so, so and it was August. Um, 
the one the other uh, the other one was down here at the intersection it's in tate the intersection of the one goes that goes out by uh our lady of the mountains that road yeah and then that next big intersection it was off where the net the hill down or down down below the cemetery and they had cut the front paws off and it'd been by the time i got there it'd been there several days and it was i'm equipped to deal with all that but it was pretty bad but somebody that morning had cut the paws off the reason why they do this oh and then oh by the way this one up here has canines cut out the the so what they do there it's 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 trophy stuff it's people with you know, we talk about pride that's what that's what they're doing so uh and georgia dnr has only told me uh, two bears two of the 44 bears that i've done since not, uh, 2019 that somebody has called you legally you can do it but you got to call georgia dnr and there's a 1-800 number the ranger hotline you can call them and tell them but only twice that's happened uh, so you know you can pick up the bear you can take it with you where whatever but you got you gotta let georgia dnr know within 48 hours and it doesn't happen so it's called the roadkill law uh, let's see what else. This uh, last August or last September was a bear up in Talking Rock with an arrow in its throat. Uh, this was a poaching incident back in 1997. If you go up to um, if you go up to Old uh, uh, Fort Mountain, if you go to Fort Mountain, uh, this taxidermy is there, and that's the bear because they he the guy got caught pulling it out with a jeep. Um, Big Canoe and I have a partnership. Um, They've called me about a couple of black bears, uh, road kills. These two over here, I went, and what I do when I go to a road kill, I measure it, uh, it's girth. I measure it uh, from no nose to nubbin, and um, I pull a premolar tooth, and I do some other, you know, measure the paws and gather some other data, and I do a report to Georgia DNR. Uh, let's see here, what else on these guys? Oh, oh there's a last, oh, what's it, 20? 2022, May 2022, there's a sow that had a couple of cubs and she got hit and was dragged and she was mortally wounded. She was dragging herself and the cubs were, were still with her. I, we, I spent a day with some big canoe members, uh, members of the, the Black Bear Project and we, uh, we tried to look for it. DNR found it and had to euthanize it, of course. I never got told what happened to the cubs. Oh, and... Uh, Lots, I get, have gotten calls about uh, up, <coughs> up around the Monument Road area, uh, one, uh, feeding bears, and then um, that road, stretch of road out there, I forget the name of it, Burnt Mountain Road, yeah. I think. Uh, uh, they got uh, uh, reported road kills, and by the time I get there, the bear's gone. So, uh, outdoors, just use common sense. Don't run. Don't run from the bears because it may trigger their instinct like a dog. It'll chase you. Um, know what to do. Carry bear spray. Know how to use it. Um, don't approach. Don't approach it. Stay still. If it knows you, it, you see it and it does as before it knows you. you. Um, if it sees you, back away slowly. Don't run. Uh, if it approaches. Just, you know, a lot of people say, hey, just talk to the bear and don't yell at it. Just kind of back up, make yourself look big, throw your arms up, and keep backing up. And we got some of that material back there. And, uh, and if the bear does come after you and makes contact with you, do not play dead. That's grizzly stuff. We don't have grizzlies here. Fight, 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 fight. Pick up something because you're, you're probably fighting for your life at that point. <laughs> don't wear perfume or body lotion or smelly good stuff when you go in the woods, ladies, and dudes too, some dudes wear stuff, because they smell 2,000 times better than a human does. This girl, and I talked to, the. this is Mexico, and when I was at the Human Bear Conflict Workshop, I talked to the wildlife folks from Mexico, because they're there, and I was like, oh, I was like, hey, what's up with this? And they're like, oh yeah, they're like, oh yeah, she had strawberry body lotion on. And this bear was habituated. See, it's a probably it's probably about a it's at least a yearling, but it's probably like a three year old. And he's used to is used to being around humans. They end up euthanizing it. They relocated it first and then they just kept feeding it and they end up having to euthanize the bear because of stupid humans. Yeah. So leave the earbuds at home.
when you're walking and stuff. Listen to nature. Uh, dogs. Please put your dogs on the leash. Know what you're getting to. Carry bear spray. This is the typical scenario. Sorry, ladies. This is the typical scenario. And when I drove in today, I saw a lady with two full-size poodles didn't have the dogs on a leash. So, having said that, this is the typical scenario. Ladies on trail. A dog is, usually it's a, you know, a cotton ball on stilts. And, uh, <laughs> and she's walking down the trail. The dog's out ahead of her, not on a leash. Dog makes contact with the bear. Bear initially runs, and the bear like, hey, I'm going to go after you. And the bear, the bear turns around and starts chasing. What's the, bear, what's the dog going to do? Goes, to, goes back to its human. So it goes back to its human, and what's the human do? Human gets in between the bear and the dog. So the dog is usually unharmed. The, one, the uh, human usually gets scuffed up some, and then the bear, when they find it, it's going to get euthanized. So please put your dogs on a leash in bear country. Conclusion real quick. Uh, if you want to help me out doing table events, I've got five coming up, and I need volunteers. And that's, that's Earth Day. So the, the two I need help on is the uh, Georgia Mountain Trail Festival in LJ, Georgia. Um, you can sit there inside, but we'll have a table and everything, and hopefully pair up somebody with an experienced person with an unexperienced person. And then the one, other one's in uh, Santi Nacucci. We've, we've done that event a couple times already. Great folks. This one here, we've done the Georgia Mountain one, we've done several times before. Uh, they're, great, they're great folks, and it's, in, it's indoors. And uh, I can't tell you to drink or not drink. You're adults. But uh, that's, that's what they have there. Um, <laughs> I, I'm doing a new event down in uh, Smyrna, Tennessee, I think it is, or Swanee, somewhere down some nature center down, a nature preserve down there that we've never done before. So I usually, when I do those events for, for the first time, I go there myself. Uh, donations. Uh, what we do, you know, we buy stuff like the, you know, the outdoor our outdoor brochure, Bearwise outdoor brochure, I just bought 5,000 $5, of those for $409, and I, I got to get our thingy, our, our educational brochure, I get 7,000 of those done, it's about $2,000. So um, anything helps uh, uh, for, for donations. Uh, we are 501c3, and a uh, little humor. So uh, you know we know we all know the regional 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 stuff. The, the bantering has been going on since the formation of the United States. Um, so this is published in the uh, the Rise and Fall in Georgia uh, Dade County Gazette from 1882. Uh, for those who can't see it, well, this is a bear. If you don't, it's a probably a, probably a yearling. Right there, this is what August. Yeah, it might be a it might be a cub of the year. Uh, so somebody took his picture, and it was in the Gilmer County paper uh, back in 2018. A boy near Trinity, California, found a black bear in the woods and led him home by the ear, sur uh, surpri uh, supposing the beast to be a dog. Uh, bears are strange creatures. So are California newspapers. <laughs> so you look at that. If somebody hadn't seen. You know, I, they think that might be a dog. So uh, I thought it was the two matchup was pretty funny. Uh, for those of you that uh, uh, believe in uh, saints, uh, this is Saint Humbert. He's the next guy that has a uh, a bear story in his his life. Uh, but uh, he passed away in around eight, six, the year six eighty. Uh, his his horse, his pack carrying horse. He was on the way to Rome and his pack carrying horse was killed by a bear, which you know, back there in the Pyrenees Mountains area is going to be a brown bear. Of course, all, all the ones in Europe are, are brown bears. And uh, he scolded the bear and used the bear for his pack animal and went to Rome. And then just short of Rome, according, according to the story, just short of Rome, his guardian angel told him, Said they're they're sending somebody sending a, a, 
another a horse for you. And so he let the bear go and the bear went back to where it came from. So um, that this, this motif, this type of story, there's a, number, there's a number of Christian saints that have this during that time period because during that time period was when Christianity was expanding out further, further into Europe. Uh, the, for those who know St. Saint, uh, Saint Benedict, Benedict XVI, uh, if you look at his, his shield, and it's got St. Corbinian's bear on there. So... Questions? Yes, yes sir. sir. Bear wise question. Yes. Combination of bear wise and dog. I'm walking my two dogs every day, three times a day, on leash. Uh, but anytime they see any wildlife, they're immediately yapping, mm -hmm. aggressive. Mm -hmm. Help me understand what my move is because I'm not going to quietly back away. I'm going to. Is the bear going to come toward me? Because I'm it just depends on the bear. Bears are like humans. They may lose their their flippant minds. No, bear, bear behavior is predictable until a dog is introduced in the situation. Once it's introduced in the situation, things normally go real quick. Um, but I want to back away. Yeah, you want to you want to back away and go around. You know, go some another direction. You don't want to go the same direction, especially this time of year because the mom with those little cubs that can't go very far very fast. She's going to be very defensive of them. Okay? The bear, Watch the bear and try to put space between you and the bear. Exactly. You do not, you do not, uh, you don't want to put yourself at risk and your dogs at risk. You got them on leash, you can control them. The other issue that we, we normally see too is humans that have dogs that they cannot control. Um, you can have a grown man with two two large dogs, and he can't control them, uh, even if they're on leashes. You know, I, I had two Dobermans. Uh, after I had the two German Shepherds, I had two Dobermans. They were my my dogs were Jerry. All of them were Jerry after I got them from rescues, so they're old and they're you know not going to do much very quickly. But even those those old Dobermans, sometimes they pulled me. They let you know, they they walk me and I didn't walk them so much. So yeah, go ahead. Second question, I I think if the answer is there's no version of being responsible with the bird feeder, you say just get the bird. Um, now if you go to Bear Wise and you go on, they talk they talk about bird feeders and there's ways to put bird feeders up that is responsible. Uh, that way the bears can't get a hold of them. But I'm telling you. Bears are Houdinis, and they can, and gymnastics. There was a one, uh, Dor, did you show, share the one where the bear's going out on the cable? No. Okay, so there's, there's, one, there's one video that I could send you that the bears, in, Nor in British Columbia, there was folks that did the, uh, they put some meat out to bait the bear, and they videotaped it, and the bear was shimmying out on a wire. It was on a wire, and the bear was, you know, had its feet up, had like a, like an air, like a, I did when I was in in the army on obstacle courses. They did, they, they answered, those were, those were probably sub adults, you know, a yearling or sub adult that was doing that. The very big bears can't do that. That was a wire cable that that, that bear was on too. So um, there are ways to do it responsibly. Responsibly, uh, go again, go to a bear wise to their uh, to their page, and they'll show you some techniques to try to try to, to do it safely okay i would say the best way to feed the wildlife is with your plants right yeah <laughs> yeah so so restoration, habitat restoration the plants that have berries and trees that have berries yeah. and all my 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 our property is a saint cattery habitat um we attract birds and hummingbirds too by the plants that we have. Um, you know, I, our home business office, if you will, is on the third floor. And one day we were sitting up there and we had two or three hummingbirds that were flying outside, outside our window, which is pretty cool. So we, during COVID, we planted, we planted natural attract, natural native attractants to bring the birds, to bring the birds in. We've had every year we have at least one or if not two uh, broods of bluebirds 
Um, we have an owl box. Uh, haven't seen the owl in it, but we we hear the owls going back and forth, uh, calling each other. Um, your deer, you don't need to feed the deer because you're feeding the bears. Please don't feed the deer. Another problem that's being seen right now is with the with the deer because the deer with this chronic waste disease and, and deer travel, you know, regardless of what you might think, they do travel and the chronic waste disease is spreading. Hunters, here in a few years, hunters in this part of the state is gonna have a rude awakening because this stuff is, it, they spread it, it's spread by them feeding. So when you have a deer feeder, I, years ago, several years ago, before we started doing the bear stuff, I had a deer feeder. And I had, one time I put a game camera on it, I had 14 deer standing there. Well, I went out there before I looked at the camera. I was like, ooh, it smells like a hog pen. I grew up on a farm. So I know what, you know, the hog pen smells like. I know what, when the cattle standing around, what they do. And I was like, oh man, this is not good. That's not, not good at all, because I smell the pee. I see the defecation. So I was like, okay, we're, we're gonna take, and then I saw the 14 deer hanging around the, the deer feeder. It's like, oh, we're, we're done. We're not doing this anymore. And that's before I, we got into doing uh, stuff with the deer. Okay, a quick observation. Uh, I was the wildlife manager for, for Lake and Wildlife for about five year period. And during that five year period, we had, of course, uh, feeding deer or, or bear is a final world fence here. So, okay. regulations. Good, good. Okay. So, the other thing is that in that five year period, we had five cubs that were killed. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, two of them were run over mm -hmm. by cars, and that was probably the June or July following the south of okay. the road which made sense. We also had one that was quite interesting where a person who went to Florida for six months put rat poison underneath their porch, mm -hmm. which was sweet and smelling. Mm -hmm. So the sow went in there, had her cubs, but she also ate and, and drank all the, the rat poison. Yeah. She eventually worked her way out and died outside, which someone saw. Right. And when we went to investigate the system, we could hear that the cubs were crying underneath the porch. And right. Three cubs, two females, one male. Anyhow, I called Adam. He came. We took the cubs, but they, they sent them up, but they ended up being euthanized because they don't want, they, they, zoos have enough bears. And they really don't want to put more bears in there. And the other thing is when they become habituated to humans, mm -hmm. they're nothing but a problem. So well, um, we don't want to get to the point of the bears getting habituated. I don't know what year that was, but Georgia DNR was Georgia DNR was partners with the Appalachia Bear Rescue until 2006. Around that time, something happened. Now, I've heard both sides of the story. I know what I believe, I, I know what Appalachia Bear Rescue, what the mission they do, and they've, they've, they've rescued, returned, uh, rehabilitated, and returned to the wild. Uh, almost 400 cubs of the year or yearlings up to 24 months old. Okay. okay. This was in 2018. Okay. Here's the other thing, I don't understand why Georgia does not have regulations that prohibit people from feeding bears? Uh, that's a good question. And I've asked that, that question too. Matter of fact, I was, well, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, um, that's a good question. Uh, there is a law in the state of Georgia that it's illegal to feed wild alligators. However, there is not a law to to dissuade people from feeding bears. They are, my, op, my observations, okay, the state of Georgia is, the Georgia DNR is short of people. Um, they are short of wildlife, uh, wildlife law enforcement. They are they have game wardens. They're uh, short of wildlife technicians. Um, and when I'm saying they're short, if they're authorized 100, they're about, at the strength of about 65. For example, uh, typically there's one DNR person per county, law enforcement person. They are they are covering multiple counties. I talked to one back in December about this bear up there, uh, the, the one I was telling you about that's up up uh, north part of the county. That uh, that person day before Christmas was was covering six counties. He was covering six counties. He couldn't come. He couldn't come and meet me. You know, I, I
told him, you know, gave him the details, gave him the, the, the lat long of where the bear was at. I said, hey, and I, then I sent him pictures of my report and all that stuff. I said, something needs to be done. Um, I don't know. I never got a follow-up. So that's the, that's the challenge they have right now. Now, we have, we, have the, we have the responsibility to try to do the best we can. And I want to say we, I'm talking about us-ins. Not just the Appalachian Georgia friends of the Bears, but humans, humans, period. It's our responsibility to, to, to try to make something good out of something bad. Now, I don't, um, there are things that me, me and Georgia DNR agree on. There's policies of theirs that I don't agree with. It's like I should have brought my pit, my, my poster. You know, imagine two circles, okay? And you put the two circles together and they kind of have an overlap. Well, there's that little overlap that we, ag we agree on. There's other stuff that they, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm sure they don't agree that I do. And there's certainly things that I don't agree with them on. So we, but we try, it's one of the things about partnerships, you know, or marriage, you know. You know when you're married, you'll make pretty babies, right? So we're trying to make pretty babies together. Uh, but sometimes it, you know, the, the relationship is not quite what you want it to be. <laughs> so. I'll be in the back if you want to come back there and ask questions. And thank, thank you, thank the committee for, for your time. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Take a picture of it and look at it by the brand name because I tried to look at it. I left my camera. Okay, it used to be. Or, now I need your glasses. Maximum alarm? Yeah. No, maximum alarm. Yeah. Okay. So if you, got, if you want to. Oh, I wondered about that. Yeah. Damn, he's a Dollar Tree. Yeah. Or, or um, you know, I got that on Walmart. So, you know, that's Walmart. This is Walmart. This is uh, the, the by Margo Supply. Uh, matter of fact, I just bought two more of those the other day, and they came in the mail. So See, this is. I so, for the deer. Yeah. I'll say, do you know what this sound, sounds like? Oh, is it going to be horrible? I'll say, okay. It works on cougars and bears. I know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you mount it like chicken, like chicken coops and stuff like that, or or your trash can. So. Uh huh. And I work down near a stream. Mm hmm. And I get really paranoid. Should okay. I be? No. I mean, uh, just you just gotta be situationally aware. Now, yeah, yes. don't wear, don't wear, right. you know, just look, look up in trees and look around. I mean, should the, I bring bear spray with me? Well, I don't. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really up to you if it makes you feel comfortable. Now, when the bears are more active, I'll carry bear spray out. We have two acres. Now, when I go out in the woods or anything and do, you put up my game cameras and stuff like that, I carry bear spray with me. Yeah. yeah, it works on humans too, so. I mean, I, oh, okay, good to know. Yeah, yeah. I or Tori are the female bears, because we saw three different model bears uh -huh. by the number of cubs. Mm -hmm. May, June, July. Okay. Now, this year, they'll be yearlings. Will we yeah. see any other bears with babies this year, or is it, are they Well, the ones, the ones that had, they, they, they got, they've got yearlings, they'll, they'll leave in May or June. Uh, and then they'll have babies next year. So we won't probably see any bears because those ladies are probably this is their area. Yeah, 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 pro probably. So if there's area. there's plenty of food sources, and unfortunately, probably in this area there's, there are. Um, again, mom mom can have a female uh, or offspring, and she shares a piece of her range with it, and so they're they're pretty altruistic in that aspect. The, the females are. Um, I'll give, give you an example. Uh, you, you ever watched the videos of the grizzlies at, at uh, Brooks Falls? Mm -hmm. um, those are all, they're all different, you know, males and females, and they have cubs and all that. Because there's so many fish, they'll, they'll share space, you know, like, like 747 has his, his spot, and then, then the other bears have their spot, and then they vie for dominance and they all understand that this is your spot now if you want to go take somebody else's spot they're gonna be a throwdown. so that that's kind of the way bears think yes ma'am um, um i walk with my dog on a leash mm -hmm. um, 
bear. I never have had bear spray. No, this is the size you need because what a lot of people will do, they'll think the police size, the personal, the personal wounds are, are bear spray. They're not bear spray. The concentration of them, are, this is one to two percent capsaicin. The stuff that the police use is only 0.04 percent. So it's a lot less capsaicin, and it's not just 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 piss the bear off. Uh, so you need to have one to two percent capsaicin, and it needs to be a canister. This is only about 30 seconds spray time. So yeah, those little ones are just. Yeah, yeah. But you would only spray that if they were really Right. Yeah, uh, depending on the brand and, and the uh, the brand and the model that you get, they vary between 30 and 40 feet. Okay. So you, you got to know what 30 or 40 feet is. A lot of people don't. Uh, so you, just, you know what you need to do is just you know paste, measure it off, paste it off, and get in your mind how long that distance that distance is. Very good. Okay. okay.